Good morning. Uh, the committee meets today to receive testimony from General Todd Walters, Commander of the United States European Command and NATO Supreme Allied Command of Europe, and General Jacqueline Van Ovos, Commander of the United States Transportation Command. Thank you both for your service to the nation, and I thank the men and women serving under your commands at this critical time. General Walters, I would also like to take a moment to recognize the tragic loss of four Marines during a training accident in Norway. Please convey the Committee's condolences to their families and fellow Marines. The security challenges for European Command, or UCOM, have never been clearer. One month ago, Russia unleashed its illegal and unprovoked attack on Ukraine, upending decades of general peace and stability in Europe. Putin's invasion has inflicted horrible suffering upon innocent civilians in Ukraine, threatened European security, and caused serious consequences for the global economy. The Ukrainian military has performed heroically in the face of this overwhelming violence, and the Ukrainian people have shown the world what true courage looks like. If Putin thought his actions over the past month would drive a wedge between NATO members and within the international community, he was badly mistaken. The conflict in Ukraine has reinvigorated the NATO alliance, and as NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg noted recently, this is a pivotal moment for European security. Since the start of the conflict, the international community has implemented a severe and far-reaching set of economic and energy sanctions, increased military and humanitarian assistance to Ukraine, and reinforced NATO's military presence along the eastern flank, including the deployment of four new NATO battle groups in Bulgaria, Hungary, Romania, and Slovakia. Germany has announced historic new defense spending, Additional nations have indicated an interest to join NATO. And even Switzerland has announced an intent to freeze Russian financial assets. The international community has united in a way not seen in generations. UCOM and TRANSCOM are playing a critical role in this effort. American troops continue to operate enormous forward logistics centers to receive, identify, and transport the majority of security aid intended for Ukraine from across the international community. This has been a Herculean task executed with admirable skill on very little notice. I would ask our witnesses to provide the committee with any updates and also to help place the current Ukraine crisis in the larger context of our long-term competition with both of our strategic competitors, Russia and China. Keeping an eye to the future, an important reality we are seeing in Ukraine is that any potential adversary is going to attack our logistics support systems. This idea of congested logistics will include obvious threats to our forward bases, as well as the aircraft and ships that resupply those bases. It also could include cyber attacks against the information technology systems that support our deployments, government, and commercial, and possible kinetic attacks against ports and airfields supporting our deployments. I am concerned that our thinking about logistics during conflict has defaulted to our experiences dating back to Vietnam, that we have owned the sea and airlines of communication and have had only to worry about logistics efficiency, not effectiveness. General Van Ovos, I would like to know what steps are being taken to prepare for such threats to our logistics and how the military services can alter their acquisition programs to take these concerns into account. Thank you again to our witnesses. I look forward to your testimonies. Now let me recognize the ranking member, Senator Inhofe. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, General Walters, General Van Ovos. It's uh, nice having you here. I mean, we are pr always proud of you and the contributions that you make. But I've said uh, several times before this committee's uh, top priority has been ensuring the effective implementation of the 2018 National Defense Strategy. It's still good today. Uh, it told us China is our pacing threat and that we need much more effort from our military to take on that threat. The threats have only gotten worse since then. Yesterday, the administration sent us a classified uh, 2022 national defense strategy. I hope the unclassified version is public soon. I understand this strategy was late in part because the Biden administration revisited what we uh, were uh, what were likely rosy assumptions about uh, China 
It's a good reminder that we must deal with the world as it is and not as we would have it to be. Our plan to deal with that world must rest on the strong foundation of military power and it must focus on actions, not words, for credible deterrence. Four months ago, um, Secretary Blinken justified not sanctioning Russia by saying, quote, President, uh, the president believes that sanctions are intended to deter. Last week, the president himself said, and this is a quote, sanctions never deter. Uh, nothing about the, this makes sense. Deterrence failed in Ukraine. Uh, we must ensure it does not fail anywhere else. The costs of war are far greater than the costs of, of uh, preventing war. We must ensure that our combatant commands have what they need to uh, credibly deter our adversaries and address the challenges of strategic competition. These threats highlight the need to, for real gro growth in the defense uh, budget and a sense of urgency and willingness to take risks both at the Pentagon and here in Congress. Uh, we just received the President's fiscal year uh, 23 budget and it does not request the real growth we need. Uh, we'll do our due diligence in our uh, constitutional duty as we did last year. General Walters, I look forward to hearing your assessment of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and how the United States and our NATO allies will bolster European defenses while continuing to support Ukraine's ability to defend itself. And I'm troubled by a lackluster funding for the European Deter Deterrence Initiative in recent years and concerned about the ability of our industrial base to support rearming ourselves, our NATO allies, and the Ukrainians. General Ovost, uh, I would like to know if uh, you have the resources you need to support uh, not only the General Walters in Europe, but also our uh, indo uh, commander. Additionally, I look forward to hearing your views on our current sea lift readiness and how that impacts your ability to support our combatant command uh, 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 counterparts. So thank you both again for your testimony today. Um, Senator Reid. Thank you very much, Senator Inhofe. Uh, uh, General, uh, you may begin. Chairman Reed, Ranking Member Inhofe, and distinguished members of the committee, on behalf of the men, women, and families who serve our nation, we extend our thanks for your steadfast support. It remains a privilege to serve alongside these dedicated patriots and our allies and partners. It's also an honor, sir, an honor to testify alongside my longtime shipmate and General Jackie Van Ovost. Her transcom team continues to deliver miracles at the point of need. We're fully aligned with the Department of Defense priorities to defend the nation, take care of our people, and succeed through teamwork. Every day we work to generate peace with our allies and partners by strengthening the deterrence and defense of the Euro-Atlantic. This is a pivotal moment in Europe with generational implications. When testifying before this committee last year, Russia was already on the path to further intimidate and threaten Ukraine while testing the will and resolve of the transatlantic alliance. Russia's premeditated and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine has galvanized our allies and global partners. We admire the courage and tenacity of the Ukrainian armed forces and citizens, and so respect their sovereign democracy. In the Euro-Atlantic area, NATO remains the cornerstone of deterrence and defense. As we face the largest conflict in Europe in three generations, our transatlantic alliance has responded in all warfighting domains. In the air, NATO has established an air defense architecture along the eastern flank that includes contributions from 11 allies. On land, allies continue to deploy additional forces to enhance its forward presence from Tallinn in the north to Sofia in the south. At sea, our standing maritime forces are infused with additional capabilities to ensure freedom of navigation spanning from the Arctic to the Aegean. Aircraft carriers in the Mediterranean dramatically increase the inherent air combat capability in NATO's air defense architecture along the Eastern Front. 
NATO's capabilities in space and cyberspace are more closely integrated than at any other time in the Alliance's history. The sum of these modern, multi-domain capabilities underwrites the security of NATO's Article 5 guarantee. A protagonist of our commitment to NATO begins with our efforts in the United States European Command. Our primary mission is to compete, deter, and prepare to respond to aggression with the full weight of the NATO alliance. Our investments in military-to-military -military relationships, training, and readiness build unity, resolve, and combat credible deterrence. USUCOM, with support from forces in the continental United States, has sparked allies to enhance posture along the eastern flank, rapidly deploying three brigades of European-based and CONUS-based combat forces, a carrier strike group, and fourth and fifth generation fighters. This effort is America's effort, with soldiers, sailors, Marines, airmen, guardians, and Defense Department civilians from all 50 states and territories some based in Europe, others rotating into Europe from across the nation. This build is enabled by years of focused investment through the European Reassurance and Deterrence Initiatives, commonly referred to as ERI and EDI. These enhancements, including facilities, prepositioned equipment, rotational deployments, and all domain exercises, improve our speed and agility. As a brief example, thanks to EDI and ERI, we were able to deploy the entirety of an armored brigade combat team from Georgia in the United States to Germany in just one week. That level of speed and agility is unmatched. On behalf of the men and women of European Command, we thank Congress and the American people for their contributions to this effort. The capabilities the Department has brought to bear in response to this acute security environment have required critical partnerships with U.S. Transcom, U.S. Cybercom, U.S. Stratcom, and the intelligence community. These partners are vital to establishing and sustaining our current deterrence and defense posture. We are witnessing a generational moment, a historic demonstration of unity and will, and an unprecedented effort by allies to strengthen defense while simultaneously helping those in need. Just an example, but it's a critical one. We've seen Germany commit to meet the Alliance 2% benchmark, and we expect other allies will follow and redouble efforts to adequately invest in defense to generate peace. From Turkey in the southeast to Norway, Sweden, and Finland in the north, in air, land, sea, space, and cyber, allies and partners are committing. Chairman Reed, Ranking Member Inhofe, we thank you again for this opportunity, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, General Walters. General Van Ovos, please. Chairman Reed, Ranking Member Inhofe, distinguished members of the committee, good morning. It's my honor to join you today with my senior enlisted leader, Fleet Master Chief Donald Myrick, to represent the men and women of the United States Transportation Command. Every day, I'm immensely proud of their contributions to national defense. As I sit here today, we are in lockstep with General Walters in providing critical aid to Ukraine and assuring our NATO allies through troop deployments and exercises. Transcom coordinates the Joint Deployment and Distribution Enterprise, creating a strategic comparative advantage through logistics that no other nation can achieve. Our success would not be possible without the steadfast support of this committee and the whole of Congress. Transcom operates an agile and resilient logistics enterprise comprised of our military components, commercial partners, and industry teammates delivering for our nation, our allies, and partners around the world. We project and sustain the world's most capable military force. The speed and reliability at which we execute these missions demonstrates our nation's resolve and serves as a deterrent to our adversaries. However, the world is evolving, and the complex contested environment that is emerging will test the future readiness of our enterprise and challenge Transcom's ability to deliver a decisive force when needed. It's imperative that we evolve into a more agile, resilient mobility force through focused modernization and recapitalization of our capabilities to ensure we remain ready now and into the future. 
My top readiness concern remains sea lift as 70% of our government owned surge sea lift ships will approach the end of their service life in 10 years. I greatly appreciate your support on the authorization and funding of the first steps of our sea lift recapitalization effort. The funding for five used ships in the FY22 omnibus appropriations will enable us to continue this vital process and we look forward to working with the Navy to satisfy restrictions in current law to execute these purchases. Next, air refueling is critical to the Joint Forces' ability to deploy and employ an immediate force. I appreciate your continued support to funding the KC-46 recapitalization program and critical modifications to the KC-135 aircraft. We must continue to modernize and recapitalize our aging air refueling assets to ensure that they remain agile, resilient, and relevant to the future fight. One last and very critical thought. Cyber is an area of significant vulnerability for Transcom. As we are inextricably linked to our commercial industry and 90% of our systems operate outside the Department of Defense Information Network, we remain focused on strengthening uh, partnerships with our transportation providers to mitigate cyber vulnerabilities. As such, cyber resiliency and digital modernization initiatives are a top priority. Just as we are engaged globally in supporting the DOD's operations, we have vital responsibilities to take care of our DOD employees and their families. Among the most important is the management of the defense personal property system, responsible for the movement of household goods. Our continuing overhaul of this system, to include the recently awarded Global Household Goods contract, strives to deliver both the high quality our service members, department employees, and families deserve, as well as the accountability Congress demanded. I am honored to join General Walters in his last appearance before this committee and thank him for his nearly 40 years of service to our country and his commitment to our nation's security. Together with all combatant commands, Transcom routinely demonstrates the nation's ability to fight, deliver, and win. I'd like to thank you once again for your leadership and for the support you provide our service members. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, General Van Ovost. Uh, General Walters, uh, the uh, initial Russian plan uh, did not work in their favor, thank goodness, and due to the courage of the Ukrainian people and the support of the international community. So it appears now that they are engaged, as they were in Chechnya and other episodes, in a campaign of attrition and uh, directed attacks on civilian targets rather than military targets. And the question really in that context is, uh, uh, can the Ukrainian forces maintain their efforts and can we continue to maintain our support for the Ukrainian forces? Chairman, I think we can and we will continue to maintain our support for the Ukrainian Armed Forces. Uh, we'll do so with, with material support as well as thought. And as you well know, we've made dramatic improvements in our information and sharing and intelligence sharing. And as they continue to, to prosecute their campaign, our, our advice and our assistance with respect to material will be very, very important. Thank you. Now, uh, we are in the midst of a tremendous uh, sort of shift or pivot, as the General Secretary of NATO said. Uh, what areas should we be encouraging our European and international allies to take to face this uh, not only present threat, but, but the continuing threat of Russia and China? Chairman, I think we have to comprehensively improve our military disposition in, in all quadrants and in all domain. And we, we have a plan in place to do so. And as the Secretary General approaches the Leaders' Summit this June, his overall NATO plan coincides with that military plan to ensure that we can show greater NATO strength and greater military strength. And as you well know, uh, we're on the appropriate glide path to do so as we continue to fortify the eight battle groups that exist in the proximity of Eastern Europe. Thank you. General Ogost, uh, the issue of contested logistics, which you touched upon, 
includes not just uh, the platforms to carry material, but getting that material through to uh, our uh, forces in the Pacific, in, in, in Europe, or any place in the world. And with the uh, ability to, of our adversaries to detect and to hit targets at long ranges, how are we planning to, to do that? Chairman, that is of concern uh, to us. And as we work in the Indo-Pacific with Admiral Aquilino, uh, we are looking at a strategy of diverse and disperse. In other words, we, we are seeing that we're going to have more distributed operations in more locations, which will provide us that redundancy and resilience, and then diversity to have some, some capability to move with, with respect to ships on the water that are in motion, which are harder to target. Uh, than, the, than a large single location where we stack up our logistics. So we are very much looking at how we do intra-theater disbursement at a time and place where we'll be able to resupply the forces securely but keep it moving so that they don't become targets into the future. That gets back to the agility of the force that we need. And to do that, our forces need to be connected. They need to be on the network. Uh, our ability to securely command and control and understand where the forces are, where the logistics are, and where they need to go. So in some respects, uh, communications is, is the primary uh, tool in the, your efforts. Yes, Chairman, the ability to securely command and control and direct the resources to the highest priorities is a critical, uh, critical capability that we have. Also, I think by implication, you would need a, a significant number of platforms and pr probably smaller than the ones we we're customarily used to. And in addition, we'd have to take steps to try to electronically uh, hide those uh, vessels. Is that correct? Or airplanes? Yes, Senator, we know that now that we uh, cannot afford to simply disperse uh, forces into the field. They have to be integrated integrated with all joint functions, with, with fires, maneuver, force protection. So in that, in that manner, we are, we are going to have to deploy in packages forward. And to your point, it's not simply large, uh, large ships or large aircraft. It, it'll be a variety of capabilities uh, depending on the scheme of maneuver and who, and who we're uh, uh, supporting. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you both. Senator Inhofe, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, um, the recent Emergency Supplemental provided an additional $3 billion to support Ukraine, backfill our allies, and invest in uh, United States stocks dedicated to this effort. Uh, General Walters, you have indicated that uh, UCOM needs significant increases to sustain efforts to deter Russia, including through the, uh, through the European deterrence initiative that the Biden administration cut last year. Okay, um, um, General Walters, credible deterrence only works when you have a strong national defense backing of the, our, our words. And uh, President Biden's warnings to Putin clearly failed to stop this in his invasion. Uh, Russia's actions are a wake-up call for this administration. And for Europe and Russia, uh, the, the Russia remains a significant threat. As your opening statement attests, this critical, this crisis has provided how much of a game changer the European Deterrence Initiative has been since it enabled the military to stand up the army preposition stock sites that our troops have now fallen in on. Um, can you expand upon how critical those sites have been to enable our troops to surge in Europe over the past um, few weeks? Senator Inhofe, to, to take an armored brigade combat team and launch it from the continental United States and put it on European turf and have the tanks that comprise that brigade combat team to shoot, move, and communicate, and fire on range in one week is, is an amazing accomplishment. And, and that was facilitated by those Army preposition stocks, and it was practiced in previous exercises, which are very expensive and, and part of the EDI fund. So I, I would just say that 
when, when we've demonstrated to the European community and to the NATO community and to the world how well we can shoot, move, and communicate and transition a large force uh, from CONUS to Europe at, at that pace is, is something that demonstrates the great value of EDI. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And are there any force elements included in the new uh, 20,000 uh, forces that you have in Europe? now that would be extremely useful in your deterrence efforts in the long run in the future? There are, Senator, and most of them have to do with critical enablers that you're very familiar with, and we've been able to, to benefit from their existence as they've arrived in Europe. Good. good. Um, and, uh, uh, General Ben Ovos, uh, strategic lift refers to the ability to transport personnel, equipment, and, and uh, stores from the continental United States to operational theaters around the world. General Ben Ovos, as the, we discussed in my office, could you further describe the current readiness of the sea lift fleet? Uh, thanks, Senator. Uh, look, the Sealift fleet is critical to our execution of our plans. They move 90% of the cargo in wartime. And today, as we stand, about 70% of our roll-on, roll-off capacity uh, is, is going to exceed its service life in 10 years. Uh, our ability to keep uh, those, air, those uh, sea lift ships in status, in a readiness status, is costing more and more every year. So it's been imperative that we embark upon the sea lift recapitalization program for which I am I'm grateful uh, for uh, the appropriation and the authorization which will get us up to four used ships uh, and then we are going to work with the Navy to get beyond four up to nine um, as they submit uh, their sea lift build plan and hopefully that that will satisfy the requirements so we can continue to purchase uh, sea, lab, sea lift when the favorable conditions are occurring right now in the market. That's good, and I, I think they will. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Inhofe. Uh, Senator Jill Levine, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Walters, um, Senator Ernst, uh, Rosen, and King, we just returned from visiting with our troops in Germany and um, meeting Ukrainians as they flee across the border into Poland. Um, can you give us, consistent with this uh, unclassified setting, an update on uh, what UCOM's role is in facilitating both the delivery of lethal aid but also our humanitarian efforts to support the Ukrainian people? Senator, as, as you're familiar, based off your visit, uh, we, we had 18th Airborne Corps in the 82nd and, and, a, and a large force uh, put in play in the appropriate geographic region to assure and deter and, and part of that program was, when the conditions were right, facilitate the flow of, of citizens back and forth across the border. And, and that has certainly taken place. And the utilization of those 5,500 soldiers has enhanced our ability to secure our European population on the Polish side of the border and to take into account the disposition of activities inside of Ukraine by consulting and communicating with, with those who have departed. So that force has been integral to ensure that the four million plus refugees from Ukraine uh, have a soft landing once they come into Europe. And we've still got a lot of work to do and, and we'll continue to facilitate that flow and do the best we can from a military perspective to secure those soft landings for the refugees coming out of Ukraine. Can you speak to um Special Operations Command Europe's um, intention to establish a new forward operating base uh, in Albania to improve our current ability to operate in the Balkans. And can you speak to how this has affected our ability to um, partner with neighboring forces? I, I can, Senator. Uh, that advancement is critical. Uh, with Albania will improve their resiliency, will improve their familiarity with other nations on the peripheries resiliency, and it will make that region much stronger and, and much more ready when it comes to identifying nefarious activities that start to creep in and the special forces do a fantastic job in the information environment of ensuring that we're out in front of uh, malign influence in that area. 
I appreciate the uh, chart that you've given us for the U.S. force posture in Europe, uh, having a total of 102,000 forces as of March 24, 2022. Um, do you envision additional changes to force posture in the next few weeks to uh, appropriately uh, stand against Russia? Senator, we take a conditions-based approach, and we look at the issues second by second, minute by minute. Uh, I would just tell you that based off the, the dynamic environment that exists today, uh, that, that number uh, could change. I suspect that it probably will, and in which direction will be, de will be determined based off conditions in the environment. Um, could you please speak to the issue um, as we are addressing the ongoing situation in Ukraine? Uh, China continues to attempt to cultivate influence in Europe uh, and is another challenge that <clears throat> UCOM has to face. Do you feel that UCOM is adequately equipped to manage both the acute crisis in Ukraine as well as the long-term challenges posed by China? Uh, we, we are, Senator, and this goes back to Senator Inhofe's uh, NDS from previous years and the new NDS that is out that, that focuses heavily from a U.S. Department of Defense perspective uh, with respect to integrated deterrence and cross-COCOM activity. I'm very, very familiar with the challenges that Admiral Aquilino faces in Indo-PACOM. He's very familiar with the challenges that we face in Europe. And, and when it comes to the transactions that take place between Russia, China, and China, Russia, uh, we're, we're both very dialed into that as a result of the architecture and process that's in place in the department. Thank you. General Van Ovost, um, one issue that my office has heard from service members throughout the pandemic was how COVID delays negatively impacted their PCS, including service members being told to handle their own move due to lack of contractors and services. Do you feel that Transcom's ability to help service members has improved and that Transcom has adapted to the new normal since the onset of the pandemic? Senator, we are all also concerned uh, about the household good movement industry, and but writ large, uh, with essentially contested logistics here in the homeland, it has affected all aspects of what we do. I do believe we're headed for a more stable future with respect to the labor market and, frankly, uh, our ability to uh, complete the global household goods contract uh, means that I have, I have really good indications we're going to have the capacity necessary uh, to ensure that this doesn't happen into the future. Uh, thank you, Senator Jill Rand. Senator Worker, please. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. General Walters, in the last few moments, we've seen news reports that Moscow is committing to withdrawing a majority of its forces surrounding Kyiv. Uh, of course, it's now afternoon where the negotiators are. Um, multiple um, uh, teams have uh, been withdrawn from the axis of the attack, and DOD officials are saying they see this as a major strategy shift, according to news reports. Um, what is your assessment of the, of the um, authority and status of the current Russians who are negotiating um, at, at this moment? We had heard reports initially that they were not sending the A-team to these negotiations. Senator, I've heard those same reports, but I, I can't verify uh, whether or not they're the, the varsity or the junior varsity. I, I, I can verify that the comments you made with respect to the shifting dynamics in the ground domain in the vicinity of Kyiv are, are exactly what we see from a UConn perspective. Um, okay, well, well, we'll see um, how significant uh, that is, I'm, I'm, I've got my doubts, but we certainly hope for, for peace. Uh, let me just ask you, um, um, in terms of permanent, permanently stationed forces in UCOM, um, is our current posture uh, enough? Um, what, what are the numbers there, and should the United States have more permanent or rotational forces in UCOM? And, and specifically in the Baltics? Senator, the, the, the numbers increase uh, from a U.S. perspective as, as a result of the incursion into Ukraine by Russia have, have boosted our numbers from 60 to approximately 100,000. 
what I also examine in my other command hat is the increase of European involvement and in specific uh, targeting of what we're doing with respect to the population and the capability increase in the Baltics. We, we've seen a dramatic shift as a result of contributions from multiple nations. Uh, s several have been published in, in, in open press, Germany, the United Kingdom, Denmark have all been very, very generous with respect to their recent contributions to the EFP battle groups. But, sir, Baltic. what is your recommendation as to more uh, permanent U.S. forces? I think what we need to do from a, from a U.S. force perspective is look at what takes place in Europe uh, following the completion of the Ukraine-Russia scenario and examine the European contributions and brace, based off the the breadth and depth of the European contributions be prepared to adjust the U.S. contributions. And, and my suspicion is we're, we're going to still need more. And obviously there's always a mix between the requirement of, of permanent versus rotational, and there are pluses and minuses of each one. We'll have to continue to examine the European contributions to make a smart decision about where to go in the future. Uh, okay. Um, let me ask you about expectations when this war uh, began. What we were hearing is the Russians uh, would would defeat the Ukrainians and uh, obtain their invasion objectives within uh, five days or so. Is there an intelligence gap in our capability that made us overestimate the Russians and underestimate um, the defensive capability of the Ukrainians? Senator, there, there, there could be, and as we've always done in the past, when, when this crisis is over with, we, we will accomplish a, a comprehensive actor action review in, in all domains and in all departments and find out where our weak areas were and, and make sure that we can find ways to improve. And, and this could be one of those areas. And then finally, uh, what barriers do you see increasing the number of uh, DDGs in ROTA to six? Senator, the infrastructure is set as a result of the tremendous EDI contributions over the years. And as we speak, uh, we have temporarily uh, put more destroyers into uh, UCOM's portfolio, and we've been able to test the infrastructure receptiveness in Rota to taking on two more cruiser destroyers, and we're ready, willing, and able to support. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Worker. Uh, Senator Blumenthal, please. Thank you both for your service and thank you for being here today. And uh, General Van Aulis, uh in my visit to the border a couple of weeks ago, uh, I was impressed not only with the incredible courage and resilience of the refugees coming across the border, but also the work of the 82nd Airborne in that area, enabling the Ukrainian military to transport many of the resupplies of weapons, Singer and Javelin missiles and so forth, to the forces on the ground, uh, sometimes within hours of the unloading to actual combat. Uh, would you agree with me that the Ukrainians, and they are the ones who are transporting, I know that none of your men or women are involved, but would you agree with me that they have been extraordinarily agile and effective in their transporting across Ukraine under fire or potential fire uh, to their forces of those weapon systems and other supplies we're providing? Thank you, Senator. Uh, look, I, I absolutely believe that they have been effective, as you could see, uh, that none of the lines really have been hit on the way, and it appears uh, they've uh, been delivering right to the right location at the right time, and I want to thank uh, everyone with respect to supporting uh, the logistics flow and, and be able to donate uh, the security cooperation that has been so successful to date. Yeah, the 82nd Airborne has been extraordinary. I know that other forces of the United States and NATO allies have been as well. General Walters, uh, as uh, 
very far from the expert that you are in this area. I think to many of us, it looks like the Ukrainians could win this fight if it were a fair fight on the ground and if they were not vulnerable from the skies to the reign of terror that the Russian military has unleashed through artillery, jet fighters, missiles, and the urgent and predominant need is aerial defense. Could you tell the committee how many S-300s, SA-3s, what is the inventory that's available to provide to Ukraine so that it can defend itself and, uh, in effect, have a fair fight on the ground and also pr protect civilian targets, which Vladimir Putin has mercilessly and ruthlessly hit repeatedly? Senator, in a different setting, I'd, I'd adore the opportunity to give you specific numbers. Uh, wh what I can say is, from a U.S. perspective, there is consultation about supply and demand on the Ukrainian armed forces in to, to ensure that, that they're getting the right equipment at, at the right time based off their military campaign uh, design so that they can best protect their forces. In your judgment, are they getting what they need? They are, Senator. And are we replenishing or backfilling, for example, as we apparently did in Slovakia with Patriot missile systems, the air defense that our NATO allies need if they are providing the Soviet-era uh, air defense such as the S-300s? We are, Senator, and in multiple portfolios, uh, above and beyond just the surface-to-air missiles. Uh, one of the lessons, it seems to me, of the combat so far is that the Russian tanks have been far more vulnerable than Putin ever contemplated. Are there lessons about the use of tanks here for future warfare in your judgment? Absolutely, to include the command and control of, of those tanks. And that would involve better communications systems? It would, Senator. Are you satisfied that the United States and our NATO, NATO allies could and would avoid those same kinds of mistakes if we had to respond to aggression by uh, the Russian army? We can and we could and we would. Thank you. Thanks, General, and thanks for your many years of service uh, to both of you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Senator Blumenthal. Senator Fisher, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, General Walters, for your many years of service. Uh, thank you, General Ovost, for being here today as well. Uh, General Walters, in your prepared testimony, you note the importance of our nuclear deterrent, and in particular our non-strategic nuclear weapons that are for forward deployed in Europe. Can you talk a bit more about their importance and the support that our allies have for this mission? Uh, Senator, what uh, nuclear strategic deterrence offers is, is tough to communicate to our European partners. And over the course of the last several years, that they've all gained a greater understanding of the freedom of maneuver uh, that, that the strategic nuclear deterrence umbrella provides uh, th those nations in Europe. And, and with, with contributions from the European nations with respect to uh, allowing the facilitation of non-strategic nu nuclear weapons, I, I feel that Europe is in a much better place to effectively defend and deter. Thank you. Can you also talk about the support that our allies have shown for the additional four battle groups and the level of interest you've seen from them in participating, please? Uh, the participation has been very, very strong. The level of interest continues to increase, and it corresponds with nations' voluntary national contributions that continue to mount uh, specifically in, in those four battle groups in Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, and Slovakia. Uh, the campaign momentum to build those minimum battalion-sized battle groups with all domain capability is improving with every day. 
And also, uh, many of our NATO allies um, are talking about increasing their defense spending, I think basically in response to the Russian invasion that we've seen in Ukraine. We've seen uh, countries in NATO, our, our allies, come together and pledge to reach that 2%. Uh, some have even pledged to go higher. Can you tell us um, how you are working with our allies and partners to ensure that the additional sources are, are really focused on the right capabilities that are needed? I can't, Senator. We, we have a strategy. We have plans that ultimately allow nations uh, to identify military requirements that contribute to delivering the appropriate effect in the environment to ensure that we can better defend. So now you have in print uh, the, the appropriate connective tissue that allows the taxpayers in all the European countries to understand why it is they're committing the euros to what cause to generate the appropriate defense, the appropriate effect to be, have better defense. Is the United States participating um, not just with, with the alliance as a whole, but with individual countries in trying to determine uh, just what is needed where, what type of capabilities are needed where when you look at the entire alliance? Senator, the U.S. is, and, and so are the other 29 nations of NATO. It, it, and that's part of the, of the great aspect of, of having an alliance like NATO. Uh, there's a lot to be learned when you are willing to listen to Estonia's needs. And, and we do, and we learn a lot, and they listen to ours from a U.S. perspective. Are you hopeful that the, the alliance will continue to work well together, that, um, that there's a new understanding about the threats that are out there? I have, I have deep concerns about um, um, the classified briefings that we have, and most of that, all of that information is not available to the people of this country. I think if we could um, see see some material that would be declassified and be able to share with, with the citizens of the United States, there really would be a, a deeper understanding, um, more concern felt when, uh, when the population understands the threats that are out there. And I can see that happening in Europe, but it took an invasion for it to happen. Uh, how, do, how are we going to address that? Senator, I'm, I'm hopeful and confident uh, that the degree of cooperation amongst the NATO nations will continue. And looking back to how we approach this campaign and the degree of intelligence sharing and information sharing and the impact that it had on building trust amongst nations was very, very powerful. And we need to continue that practice. I think we need to continue it in this country as well so that uh, the people in the United States understand the very real threats that we face to our national security. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Senator Fisher. Senator Haruno, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you both for being here. General Walters, you mentioned something that uh, definitely uh, perked uh, my interest, piqued my interest, and we know that uh, China and Russia, has, uh, they have a relationship, and China seeks to expand its influence in Europe. So you mentioned that um, you are working, I think, much more closely with Admiral Aquilino uh, because of this recognition that uh, things don't just stay in one command theater. So can you talk a little bit more about uh, the, your increased uh, uh, closer working with, uh, with Admiral Aquilino? I can't, Senator. We've, we've shared thoughts uh, about what Russia has done with respect to its physical actions in the vicinity of Ukraine and its activities outside of Ukraine with its so-called allies and partners and the impact that it has on the actual execution. And Admiral Aquilino is obviously very interested in that because he, he faces a scenario that's reasonably similar to this with respect to Taiwan mm -hmm. and, and how we examine uh, the U.S. response, the Allies and Partners response, uh, will help image Admiral Aquilino in, in working his way through uh, some of the tough spots that we anticipate that he'll have to work with in the future with respect to state-on-state -state activities and state-on-state -state alliance activities and state-on-state and -state activities with respect to other partners and allies on the periphery. 
it sounds as though this is a more uh, a close relationship that you are having with a, an, another combatant commander. So is that so? Uh, with Senator, regard I, to Indo I have, that I have that same relationship with all the other combatant commanders. Uh, that's good to know. It makes sense. General Von Ovost, uh, I, it's good to see to talk with you again. Uh, as you are aware, the Department of Defense recently made the decision to close the uh, to defuel and close the Red Hill storage facility on Oahu, and so uh, the, there will be a transition period. It will take a significant amount of planning and funding for this transition. And last year's NDA established Transcom as the DoD's bulk fuel manager. Uh, of the department, which will become effective later this year. As you assume this new role, what will be, uh, what will you be focused on to ensure the department's fuel needs are met in the Pacific? And do you, uh, what do you anticipate being the greatest challenge as Red Hill is closed and we move to a more distributed laydown? Thank you, Senator. Um, as you're aware, there's really multiple studies, analyses, and war games highlighted that are global bulk fuel, our command and control, our distribution, where it's at, access to it, um, and, and the infrastructure that supports it are inadequate uh, in this contested environment. Frankly, as the new NDS uh, also states that uh, the PRC is the most consequential strategic competitor we have. So as we look to the Pacific, uh, we have to do things differently. So what we are doing right now under the throes of providing a strategy due back to Congress here on 1 October on how we are looking at the globe with respect to posture, war reserves, our ability to, uh, to maneuver the force both uh, from an inter-theater standpoint and within the theater to ensure that we have dispersed mm -hmm. and diverse, uh, specifically with respect to fuel, to reduce the risk. Indeed, in the uh, decision to defuel uh, Red Hill, we're going to use that as an opportunity to put a storage afloat so that we can actually practice techniques and procedures that we would actually use should we, should we have, to have to go to conflict with respect to our intertheater tankers doing console operations and new intra-theater, smaller tankers that we would need to move the fuel forward into theater. So as we look to those CONOPs and developing them and resourcing them will be uh, something we'll be looking forward in the future as the global bulk fuel manager. Just one more question along those lines. So as we uh, move to a more distributed fuel operations, uh, is there an opportunity to expand investment in places like the compact states to build out a resilient fuel laid down while also building economic cooperation with our compact partners? Senator, I defer to Admiral Aquilino with respect to specific partners. He has, as you know, a, a 2B posture that's laid out that is really looking more south uh, and, and in that area. Uh, and from my perspective, um, we could not do what we do without the commercial partnerships that we have around the world. Uh, so we are looking to thicken our, our partnerships, especially out in the Pacific. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Senator Rono. Senator Ernst, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, General Van Ovost and General Walters. Thank you so much for your service and for appearing in front of our committee today. And General Walters, uh, you know that I traveled with many of my colleagues uh, several weekends ago to visit Germany and Poland, and we were grateful that for the time that we had on the ground. We had Senator Gillibrand, Senator King, and Senator Rosen from this committee. Um, so we were able to spend time uh, not only with significant leaders uh, from Germany and Poland, but also with the tremendous men and women of the 18th Airborne Corps, the 82nd um, Airborne All-American, and uh, our Armor Brigade as well. I want to thank those men and women for uh, being there on the front lines and assisting with your NATO mission. Um, but uh, as, as we focus on Ukraine, we also get very concerned about uh, movement with Russia and the thoughts that perhaps they would also engage in other countries as well. This is something we really haven't addressed in this hearing yet, but uh, dis despite the fact that Russia is stalling a bit in Ukraine, 
there are a number of Russian troops, I believe about 1,500 Russian troops that exist in Moldova. And we are concerned about that. And uh, for folks that might be watching out there, uh, Moldova is a country on the southwestern border of Ukraine. So we are concerned about, uh, about this community, this country as well. So what capabilities or uh, both militarily, perhaps you can speak to humanitarian issues as well, but what have we offered to uh, Moldova as a way of reassuring their country as well? Senator, our, our European strategy calls for comprehensive defense and shared response. And from a UCOM perspective, we examine the 51 nations as part of that grouping, and Moldova is one of them. And whenever there are opportunities to increase our ability to share more info and share more intel, we are attempting to do so, so that for all of Europe, we're improving our comprehensive indications and warnings and command and control and feedback so when problems arise, we hear about it sooner rather than later. And if there are information pieces that need to go to Moldova sooner rather than later to, to help their disposition with respect to participating in a free Europe, uh, we're, we're doing so. And, and the number of liaisons and the number of times uh, that we exchange has certainly grown over the years. Mm -hmm. Have we seen any movement of those Russian troops that exist in Moldova uh, to reinforce the actions in Ukraine, or do we see any movement shifting from Ukraine into Moldova? At this point, Senator, neither. Okay, that's good. Um, so we know that, that Poland is, has offered um, MiG fighter jets, uh, the S-300 anti-aircraft systems, uh, to support the defense of Ukraine. And to this point, the United States has chosen not to engage and be party to those transfers or to backfill our NATO allies. And my question is not why. I think there's been a lot of debate about that. But who specifically is the final authority on making the decision on what gets transferred to who? Uh, Senator, with respect to uh, my, my European job, the, the, the national leader is obviously the individual who's responsible for making that policy decision. And I say that because, as you well know, other nations were involved in this transaction. And, and the first thing that Secretary General Stoltenberg was keen on was the fact that na nations can make the choice uh, with this decision, and it typically comes from their national leaders. And if we shift back to the United States of America with the assumption that those countries are willing to receive um, or to transfer if we are to be a party of those actions, if we are transferring items, who is the ultimate authority in that decision-making chain? Our, our Commander-in-Chief. Okay. Thank you. I'll yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Ernst. Uh, Senator Warren, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, General Walters, for your leadership in responding to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I support the Ukrainian people and our allies in this work. So Congress recently approved $13.6 billion for Ukraine, including $6.5 billion for the Pentagon. We also supported NATO partners against Russian aggression for years through the European Deterrence Initiative, or the EDI. But because of the way Congress and DOD set up this fund, the Pentagon doesn't have to explain how EDI spending supports a long-term plan. EDI was first funded through the Overseas Contingency Operations, or OCO, account, which was primarily set up to support operations in Afghanistan and Iraq. But it became a slush fund for the Pentagon to funnel billions of dollars toward programs that were unrelated to those conflicts. Now, the Biden administration eliminated OCO, and to make sure that EDI didn't turn into the same thing, Congress required your command to provide annual plans for long-term EDI spending. General Walters, three of those plans have been due since the FY 2020 NDAA made this requirement the law. How many of those plans have actually been provided to Congress? Uh, Senator, I, I can tell you that UCOM has made a response and the transaction between the Department and Congress I'm not aware of. Okay, well, I'll tell you the answer. Zero. Congress 
has pumped an additional $13 billion into the EDI, and it is now highly likely that the EDI will grow in tandem, tandem with our need to support our European allies. So even though these are required by law, we haven't gotten these reports. General Walters, has your command provided the, <clears throat> excuse me, the DOD with the information they need to provide those plans to Congress this year so that they can finally follow the law and submit a report? We have, Senator. I'm sorry? We have, Senator. You have provided the information. I appreciate that because I'm counting on seeing that report soon. If we don't, it sounds like the process is breaking down at DOD, and I will follow up with DOD to make sure that we get the report we need, and I appreciate your cooperation in that. Now, in addition to requiring plans for how EDI money would be spent in the upcoming year, the FY20 NDAA put in place requirements for an annual report on how EDI money was spent. Congress also never received those reports. So, General Walters, will you make sure that this committee receives a report by November 30th of this year on how EDI money has been spent to date? I will do everything within my command authority to do so, Senator. All right. Well, that one's within your command authority, so I very much appreciate that. You know, this committee is being asked to sign off on an $813 billion in national security spending next year. It's no secret that I think that level of spending is too high. Our strong multilateral response in Ukraine shows how important it is for us to invest in diplomacy, in helping refugees, and in using all of our foreign policy tools. But that does not mean giving the Pentagon a blank check or shrugging when we don't get the budget information we need to conduct spending oversight. Tracking these dollars is part of how we keep America safe and how we work with our allies. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back my time. Thank you very much, uh, Senator. And let me recognize Senator Blackburn, please. Chairman, and thank you again uh, to you all for being here. Uh, General Walters, I know this isn't because of you. Unfortunately, I think you're on the receiving end of a lot of frustration from people because of the way we've received information uh, regarding Ukraine. And I know that we need to continue and to keep a lot of what is happening on the ground in Ukraine um, in a classified space. But for the second time in less of a year, America is plunged into a military crisis for which our leadership seems unprepared and unaccountable. And I talk to a lot of veterans. As you know, we've got Fort Campbell, we have Arnold Engineering, we have the U.S. Naval Station, we've got Oak Ridge, so a lot of military in our state. and. I, I think that people really want some transparency, they want some answers, they want some accountability, and interestingly enough, silence is a message. Silence is a very strong message. And uh, it's not a message of strength. And I think that it does not work in concert with the principles on which this nation was founded. So I hope that in the near future that this committee is going to be able to have an open hearing on the issue of what is happening um, in Ukraine. Now, I want to go on to a long-term concern that we've discussed, and regardless of what is happening in Ukraine, I want us to look at what is happening with Beijing and maintaining China as the pacing challenge, not just for DOD, but for each combatant command is of the utmost importance. And it is something that this committee needs to assist DOD with, as well as to hold the different divisions accountable for. So to each of you, very quickly, 
What are the roles of your combatant commands in supporting the implementation of the 2018 National Defense Strategy with regard to China? Uh, to China? And General Walters, do you first, and then General Van Ovest. Senator, I have to do everything within my power as the commander of USUCOM to take a look at the coordinating authority activities that take place inside of, of, of my territorial boundaries and find the ones that have any potential impact with respect to China. And as Admiral Aquilino governs and manages yeah. his UCP, he needs to do the same with respect to Russia. And, and this is a process that's been in place for several years, and it's improving but it, can, it, it continues to require vigilance and scrutiny and iterations to ensure that we Let can get better. Let me ask you this. As you look at uh, what is happening with the CCP, what are the trends that are of greatest concern to you? I, I would contend that it's the activities of allies and partners as they apply to, to those nations being able to get what they want or what, what they shouldn't get. Okay. General Van Ovest. Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, with respect to trends that I look at as the Transportation Command commander, um, I monitor their ability to project power around the globe, because that is our operating area. Uh, and I'm monitoring their investments into ports and their, their impact of these investments on our ability to maneuver around the world, uh, their ability to dis disrupt and degrade our ability to project and sustain a force uh, into is the that the trend that concerns you most? You know, take Djibouti. It, so their work in areas like that where they go in under Belt and Road, but then they couple that with uh, their military. Is that kind of at the top of your list of concern? In the top of the list, of my concern is the kinetic and non-kinetic threats in the region. Okay. Uh, but they're secondarily, as I look to them maneuvering around the globe and influencing other nations' decisions, this is about allies and partners. So the second main thing we're doing is we're trying to thicken our relationship with allies and partners around the world to, to robust them against these threats. The, the, the certainly, from our perspective the military threats, but also the diplomatic and economic threats that they face uh, from China on a day-to-day -day basis. So you consider those in total and not separately? I do. I do okay. a whole-of-government approach for all of these okay. allies and partners to be able to robust them. And, and I will take it a step further. Uh, we are inextricably linked to commercial industry. So our, our commercial industry networks that are around the world right now, we're also working on thickening and protecting them. Uh, because they are working in these regions day in and day out, delivering around the world, and we rely on them as well. Thank you. I have some questions I will submit to you all, and um, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Blackburn. Let me recognize Senator King, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Walters, uh, the, uh, Putin has been talking for years about his ostensible claims to Ukraine and uh, the part of Russia and all those kinds of things. And one of his principal strategic goals seems to be a land bridge between Russia and, and Crimea. Are they making similar noises about Kaliningrad? And is this something we need to be concerned about? Or do they accept that Kaliningrad is essentially landlocked from the, from the east? Uh, sir, with respect to Kaliningrad, it's something we should always be concerned about, but over the course of the last four to five months, that has not been an issue with respect to Russian activity. Thank you. Quick question. Uh, speed of shipments from the time the order is given in Washington to authorize equipment uh, to Ukraine, how long does it take to get to the Polish-Ukrainian border? Senator, it depends. Uh, we, we've been iterating on this. It's improving. It, and we've seen cases, for example, with uh, a, a large armored brigade combat team that we've been able to, to transact that in weeks as opposed to months. So we're, we're, that's improving. And it's, it's a, these, these are timely shipments. The Ukrainians need this equipment right now, not a month from now. It's, it's improving. We, we have cases with smaller force elements uh, where it would take 28 to 30 days, and, and in many of those cases, we're, we're down to single-digit days and less I'm, than a I'm week. I'm not talking about necessarily force elements, but, but materiel, uh, weapons. That, that falls into the same category. Same category. Okay. 
Um, we heard at the beginning of the uh, invasion that there were something like 200,000 Russian troops in Belarus and in Russia. They've committed many, if not all of those. What reserves do the Russians now have? In other words, what portion of their entire uh, military force in terms of people have been committed to Ukraine uh, at this point? And, and what level of reserves do they have to call upon? Sir, in a different setting, I can give you a precise number. But uh, in the 70 to 75 percent category are, are devoted to this from a Russian perspective at this time. So a very substantial proportion of their total force is committed in, in Ukraine. Um, can the Ukrainians succeed in the east as they have around Kiev uh, by they're going to redeploy in that direction too, I presume, since the Russians are doing so? Do the tactics that they've been able to use uh, in the north and, and, and uh, northeast succeed uh, in stalling the Russians or perhaps even uh, pushing them back? Senator, I certainly believe that they can succeed in stalling the Russians. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I understand the, the, the comment. But, but they ha, have the Ukrainians improved over the course of the past month in their terms of use of the weapons and tactics? Uh, they seem to have shown significant success in the last week or two. Yeah. Absolutely, Senator. Uh, the Ukrainian armed forces show a very, very positive learning curve. Hence, I'm optimistic about being able to force additional stalling on behalf of the Russians. Uh, let me change the subject for a minute. I'm, I'm concerned that the, the Ru Russia falls into a number of different COCOMs and, uh, I'm sorry, Russia, uh, the Arctic. And I'm concerned about coordination between the various COCOMs that have a piece of the Arctic defense because Russia is certainly militarizing on their shore of the Arctic. Uh, what steps are there or do you feel that there's sufficient coordination to it, it, the whole idea of a COCOM is somebody's in charge and if you've got three or three co I think it's three COCOMs that have a piece of the Arctic jurisdiction do you feel it's sufficiently well coordinated to respond uh, to a Russian action in the Arctic as you're well aware senator in 2019 we established Northcom as the capability advocate for DOD and, and in his responsibility today uh, General Van Herk is doing a tremendous job of, of orchestrating the supported and supported relationships with the other COCOMs to the point to where all of us have plans for the Arctic, uh, being held accountable to support those plans so that we can improve our indications and warnings on our command and control so, and our so mission So NORTHCOM capability. has the lead? NORTHCOM is the capability advocate for DOD for the Arctic. I've never heard the term capability advocate. Does that mean they're in charge? It, in so many areas it does, especially when it comes to capabilities, which is ever so important for us in the military to deliver the appropriate effect in the environment. General, I have some questions for the record on, on uh, Transcom. Uh, the two specifically are cyber resiliency, which you've cited as a potential problem, or not a potential, but a serious problem, and also what lessons Transcom has learned from the Ukraine experience, a kind of preliminary after-action review, if you will. I'll submit those for the record. Thank you very much, General. Thank you, Senator King. Senator Cotton, please. Thank you both for your appearance today and your service to our nation. General Walters, I'm sure you deeply regret this will be your last appearance in front of this committee as the uh, combatant commander in Europe. Um, a couple of weeks ago, Russia shot missiles that landed about 10 miles from Poland's border. Uh, you are the combatant commander. For American forces in Europe, you are the supreme allied commander for NATO forces. What direction or authorization have you received from the president or from the NATO council about the immediate action you should take if a missile were to hit Polish territory? Continue to fortify the security disposition from a military perspective in air, land, sea, space, and cyber uh, on the eastern portion of Europe. Are you authorized to immediately strike back at that aircraft that launched the missile or a missile battery that fired it? Uh, no, I am not. By the time you received that authorization, that aircraft and that missile battery probably would have moved and no longer be susceptible to immediate strike. Is that correct? That's correct. And again, this all applies to activity that occurs in Ukraine uh, with respect to Russia, not on NATO territory. I'm disappointed to hear that you don't have that authorization, General. Um, the President said 
while he was in Europe that we are training Ukrainian forces in Poland. Is that accurate? At this time, is, is, was, is that the time setting of, of the statement? That's what the President said. Jake Sullivan said we are not. I'm just trying to figure out if we are or are not. Uh, uh, I, I do not believe that we are in the process of currently training uh, military forces uh, from Ukraine and Poland. There are liaisons that are there that are being given advice, and, and that's different than, than I think uh, you're referring to with respect okay. to training. Um, a few weeks ago, uh, President Zelensky asked for the transfer of MiG-29 aircraft from Poland. Uh, the Secretary of State said that we gave a green light to that. Two days later, um, the Pentagon said it was untenable uh, because they were afraid that it would be escalatory. Uh, were you asked for your best military advice about this decision? And if so, what was it? I was, and I provided that best military advice to the Secretary of Defense. And if Secretary Austin would like to share that with you, I know that he will. Can you help me understand how it would be escalatory to provide these aircraft to Poland if they came from us, but not if they came from Poland? I think that nations have to make the decision independently about whether or not they want to give aircraft uh, to the Ukraine. And, and, and that is certainly the case with respect to Poland's choice. With, with respect to what we do, part of the decision from a United States perspective was metered through the return on investment for the capability of those platforms versus potential escalation. And when that balance was looked at, the decision was made not to advocate giving MiGs to Poland. I, yeah, I mean, I, I understand that some people think that these MiGs would not be that useful for Ukraine, and I, I don't believe there'll be a silver bullet, but President Zelensky and the Ukrainian Mil Ministry of Defense has asked for them, and I, I think this should be a case where we respect their judgments, um, even if they just use them for spare parts for their aircraft. I, I think they've earned that right. Um, and I don't think if you're a Russian pilot, you'd view old MiGs as any more escalatory than modern Stingers if you're the one being shot in the sky. I suspect you wouldn't either, General. Are we still making distinctions between offensive and defensive weapons that we provide to Ukraine? Senator, I would expect that we're examining each and every one of the weapons and making sure that on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, we're, we're, we're taking into account the escalatory potential that they present. I just think that Russia invaded Ukraine. Ukraine is defending its soil. By definition, every weapon it has is defensive. Two weeks ago, the President announced the delivery of a package of arms to include switchblade drones. One week ago, the Pentagon acknowledged that they had not yet been delivered. Have those drones been delivered yet to Ukraine? They have not yet landed in Ukraine. They're in the process. Do we, do we know why that's taking so long? Uh, I, I do not at this time, Senator. One final question I have here. Um, this is about your placemat on the disposition of U.S. forces. Um, we have 40,000 troops in Germany. That's four times the next largest troop presence almost, and 40 percent of our total enhanced presence in Europe now. Is there a strategic reason to have so many troops in Germany, or is that just a historic artifact that it used to be the front lines of the East-West conflict? It has to do with mostly the United States Army and the availability of training ranges. So when those force elements come over, they can practice, shoot, move, and communicating. And when called to go forward, you'll have a ready force. And that's because of the, the, the long tradition that you've experienced in, in your Army career of, of Hohenfels and Grafenwehr. Can you tell me how many of those 40,000 troops that we have in Germany have, have the primary job of shooting a weapon driving a vehicle or flying an aircraft that can kill a bad guy? Uh, well over 70 percent. So over 70 percent of those 40,000 troops have a military occupational specialty or AFSCU that is about killing bad guys, not supporting frontline troops. That's correct. They're the teeth of the military formation. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cotton. Senator Rosen, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman Reed, for holding this critical, um, critically important hearing. General Walters, I'm sure you understand more than most that the world is watching the United States as we support our NATO allies and help the Ukrainian people defend their country from Vladimir Putin's violent, 
unprovoked war on their de democratic way of life. So with this in mind, earlier this month, I traveled to Poland and Germany as part of a bipartisan CODEL to reinforce to the world that Americans stand united in our support for Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. Throughout the trip, we did have the privilege of meeting U.S. forces supporting the UCOM mission. We received briefings from commanders on the situation on the ground in Ukraine, and we saw firsthand the security assistance and training NATO is providing. This trip underscored for me that we can and we must do more, taking additional actions to support Ukraine, helping them to defeat Putin's forces. And so I want to just turn to um, a little bit of uh, talking about humanitarian aid, because in Poland we visited a refugee center where displaced Ukrainians were seeking shelter and refuge from Putin's brutality. And I saw women and children who fled, their, all women and children primarily, they fled their homes and the lives they'd built. We heard on the ground people in Ukraine are running out of food, water, medical supplies. So, uh, General, what role is UCOM playing in supporting the U.S. military's humanitarian mission in the Ukraine? And how concerned are you that potential Russian gains might complicate your efforts to provide both the military and humanitarian assistance that they need? Uh, Senator, we're, we're very concerned, and, and UCOM is assisting with inventories uh, transactions back and forth with security assistance as well as humanitarian assistance to, to make sure that from a supply and demand standpoint uh, that the right stuff goes in at the right time with the best possible force protection and and we will vary as necessary based off trends that exist in the environment to ensure that we can as best we can safely get the right goods to the right people at the right time both from a security assistance standpoint and both from a humanitarian assistance standpoint, as a military organization, uh, we're obviously working side by side with, with many of our government partners outside of the Department of Defense, as well as those that represent uh, departments outside of the Department of Defense in the countries where these transactions are taking place, Poland and others. Thank you. I want to move on to cyber threats because <clears throat> obviously um, You've alluded to it, General Van Ovest, and, uh, and of course my colleagues as well. And, but I want to turn to Russian gray zone tactics. Russia has launched malicious cyber attacks to target Ukraine's infrastructure, its government networks, while utilizing disinformation to falsely uh, paint Ukraine, of course, and I'm going to quote here, a Nazi regime. So, General Walters, I have a three-part question for you on Russian hybrid warfare threats. First, have Russian cyber attacks compromised Ukrainian command and control? Second, do we have adequate strategies for countering Russia's information operations in eastern Ukraine? And third, given that NATO in 2014 declared that a cyber attack could lead to the invocation of Article 5, in your view, what should be the threshold for a Russian cyber attack that could lead to invoking Article 5? Senator, the first question that has to do with Ukrainian C2, as I think most of us have seen uh, in, in, in the public domain, uh, the Ukrainian C2 is currently in place uh, from a whole of government perspective on Ukraine's part all the way down to the military. So I, I would contend that Russia has been very challenged in that area and, and Ukraine has been continued to be successful. I, I think the strategic implications are profound and I, I believe that when we examine what has taken place up to this point, and, and, and write books about it in the future, we'll look back and conclude and be comfortable with the fact that we have dramatically, from a U.S. perspective and NATO perspective, improved our tactics, techniques, and procedures as they contribute to a campaign in the area of offensive cyber and defensive cyber, and as well as the manipulation of, of how information comes out and how we can ensure that the truth still gets to the appropriate point. And I, I, I would just say that when it comes to what NATO does to declare an Article 5, as a military commander, what I'm responsible for is ensuring that we have all of the facts. And as you well know, Senator, we typically wind up in situations to where the next day after we quickly discover that we didn't have all the facts. And what I would owe the North Atlantic Council and NATO so that they can make the appropriate decision is to give as many of those facts as I can and provide my best military advice to the North Atlantic Council that would be responsible for making that decision. All 30 nations 
about whether or not to enact Article 5. And in situations like this, when it comes to cyber, it's, uh, it's very difficult to get the facts, and you have to work hard to make sure that you get those, and that would be my responsibility at the time when that would occur. Thank you. I see my time is up, but General Van Ost, I'll take this for the record about investing in the right cyber talent and modernizing IT capabilities in order to support all of this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Rosen. Senator Kramer, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to both, both uh, generals for being here and for your incredible service. Um, General Walters, I want, I want to begin with you, go back to a conversation you had with uh, Senator Wicker specifically about the uh, distinction of uh, permanent assigned forces, as we obviously see this increase now in, in force. And I, as I understand, um, and maybe I'll drill down a little more, he, he was asking about permanent assigned forces. I think the bottom line was you said we, we should probably grow them. What I'm wondering is over the last several years as, as we've been drawing down EURCOM, CENTCOM, or EURCOM and CENTCOM to prepare more forces for uh, other places, specifically the Pacific. Uh, and you've talked a little bit with Senator Hirono about the, the global issue. Um, how, do you, how do we reconcile the need for more forces everywhere? Do we just grow the force, or does this management of personnel become much more, much more difficult? And, and by the way, may, I might also ask, um, and how does agile combat in, in, you know, play into all of that? We in North Dakota are very... Um, cognizant of the B-52s and the role they've played, uh, exercising, obviously. Um, maybe just talk a little bit about ACE and how that fits in as well. Well, Senator, first, agile combat employment is very helpful. Wh whether or not you're addressing permanent or, or rotational forces, to, to be able to take a unique capability and quickly insert it into a region, and then when, when no longer does it deliver the effect that helps enhance peace in that region, pull it out and get it back home where it needs to be to refit and be ready to respond globally. It, it's incredibly important. Uh, w with respect to permanently assigned versus rotational, uh, as we've seen what has unfolded in Ukraine uh, with respect to Russia, it's allowed us the opportunity to take a look at a whole of government, uh, multi-domain uh, force, and, and examine what shifts we could possibly make in the future. And I, I contend that we would probably be wise to examine what has unfolded in Ukraine and Russia and the periphery nations. And certainly uh, f from a NATO perspective and being a commander uh, with respect to those NATO forces, those contributions that those allies and partners have committed impacts the appropriate effect that we can deliver, which goes all the way back to how smart we need to be with respect to making the right decision, giving global ramifications on permanent versus rotational. And the answer is still, I believe it depends. Uh, there's always goodness and badness in both cases, but I think we need to be smart about it and refit just a little bit and examine what's unfolded here to make a prudent decision going forward. Well said, and you actually anticipated my next question and answers, answered it, so thank you. Um, speaking of whole of government, General Van Ovos, you, you probably um, are as engaged in the whole of government approach as much or more importantly probably than anybody. There are two things that you've said that I, um, one in your opening statement, and, and I'll, I'll, I think it was your opening statement, where you said something to the effect that I look forward to working with the Navy to satisfy restrictions in current law. I think that was regarding um, the building of ships, right? And, and, and could you just elaborate a little bit on um, satisfy restrictions in current law? Sh should we be changing restrictions? Are you implying that? Or are you just saying there's a lot of bureaucracy that we have to work through and, and help me help you? Uh, thanks, Senator. Uh, the authorization is uh, to purchase up to nine used sea lift ships. Uh, four ships without a requirement for new build but to, in order to purchase the fifth ship, uh, the Navy has to submit a plan for 10 new ships being built, sea lift or uh, OSV, uh, utility, uh, general utility type ships, so we can continue to purchase used number five through number nine. So while we are given, an, we, in, in 2021, we, we have now uh, purchased two ships, and we've been given the appropriation to purchase five more used ships but we'll only right now be able to purchase two more until either the, the law is changed or the Navy submits a plan that's satisfactory to the committees. 
understand. So we need to work on that. You also referenced in a conversation, uh, I don't remember which senator it was, it might have been Hirono, but um, you, you, you've referenced the term thickening partners a couple of times, I think. And I'm, what I'm wondering is, have you seen in recent months or recent years a, a changing, if you will, or, or a, a growing cooperation among our partners, with our partners in the Pacific specifically, to allow, for example, better access to ports and, and, and navigability that maybe wasn't there in the not so distant past? Are, are you seeing some improvement? Yeah, so I would say we are seeing improvement. I, I, the, the fine points of that improvement I would leave to uh, Admiral Aquilino. Uh, but as we look to both our military and our commercial networks, uh, as we are increasing our activities and exercises and interoperability with our allies and partners in the Pacific, we are seeing an increase. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Kramer. Senator Duckworth, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, to both General Van Ovost and General Wolters for joining us today. As we near the milestone of one month into the invasion of Ukraine, we are hitting a critical moment in our pledge to support Ukraine and our NATO allies. What were once seen as ad hoc efforts to gather and distribute um, uh, aid to the Ukrainian heroes combating Russian aggression will now become, or has become, a new normal. What was once an emergent situation will now test our commitment and our resilience as the fatigue of warfare sets in. This new reality will stress our own logistics networks as we have to reinforce our delivery mechanisms into Ukraine in order to deter Russian interdiction. And it will challenge our industry partners to reopen or accelerate manufacturing lines to incorporate into the next aid package and to replenish our own stockpiles. So I'd like to start off by discussing the status of our inter-theater capabilities, which are critical to the work that we're doing in Europe and will be just as critical if ever needed for a contingency in the Pacific. During our last meeting, General Van Ovos, we discussed your plans to reduce the age of your strategic maritime assets by purchasing used replacement ships. This strategy is clearly proving successful, but with 34 of your 50 assets set to retire, I am concerned that we're not moving fast enough. General Van Ovos, what are the biggest obstacles you face in your strategy to buy used maritime assets, and what can Congress do to support your efforts during fiscal year 2023? Thank you, Senator. Uh, and as we discussed, the, the aging ships are costing more to maintain, and even with that more money, we're not getting the readiness bang out of that buck. So we have had to make some prudent and cost-effective decisions to accelerate retirements of platforms uh, even without a backfill. I think most importantly, a, a stable plan of recapitalization uh, with used ships to ensure that we get the most value out of it uh, and also to stabilize the shipyards because these ships do go back and get modifications done as they come into the ready reserve fleet. So a, a nice stable platform uh, for buy um, about four a year would, would be very helpful to close and be able to mitigate those gaps. But I also want to, to just reiterate that, you know, our organic fleet will never be able to do everything we need to do. So man, maintaining a, a healthy ready reserve fleet is good, but I also want to thank this committee for their work, uh, not only on, on the continued stipend for the uh, – uh, MSP, but also for the tanker security program that we just started to provide U.S. crewed, U.S. flagged ships for both fuel, uh, fuel movement and for our regular maritime security program. These are force multipliers for us to ensure uh, that we can continue to project and sustain the force into the future. Thank you. Um, for my second question, I, I want to turn back to logistics, but this, in Europe. Um, I'd like to touch on issues of lessons learned and potential obstacles for the future. And I know we've already had a bit of a dis, um, discussion on the EDI um, with my colleague from Oklahoma, Senator Inhofe. Um, uh, given that we're nearly four weeks into this conflict in Ukraine and a month and a half into our increased presence and posture, 
we must take the opportunity to evaluate this strategy and look forward to what logistic challenges may be in our future. So General Walters, I'd like to give you the opportunity to sort of discuss what lessons related to logistics should we be learning from U.S. operations in Europe and what steps should we be taking during this fiscal year's budget cycle to plan for the enduring logistics challenge of a prolonged war in Ukraine as well as the recovery that will come after that? Senators, you will know from, from your history that this takes uh, constant scrutiny, uh, constant iterations, constant willingness to, to listen and process and prove. Uh, and, and we, uh, during the start of this campaign in the vicinity of 27 February, stood up two logistic cells that, that actually iterate on all these processes. One is UCOM represented, the other one is internationally represented. And at the end of the day, you've got to get the right stuff in at the right time, time, and it has to be appropriately defended so that those individuals that are responsible for what we're putting in are, are protected. And when it goes into the actionable area, Ukraine, it's put to good use, and then you have to track it every second along the way. And, and, and we have that data, are maintaining that data, and we continue to iterate the process and prove uh, all the way from acquiring it in CONUS to where it gets to the operator in Ukraine to make sure that we're doing the right thing from a logistics standpoint. And that's actually what those two cells are charged to do as well as current day ops. And, and at the end of the day, it takes gigantic elbow grease every millisecond of the day to get right. And you have to wake up the next morning and tell yourself you're not probably doing it right and be prepared to iterate one more time. And that's what those two cells are currently in the process of doing at Stuttgart. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Duckworth. Senator Tuberville, please. Thank you. Good morning. Um, thanks to both of your service. General Van Ost, uh, 2017, China put their first military base in Africa in Djibouti. Now it looks like they're possibly going to put one on the Atlantic side. And uh, uh, Equatorial Guinea, uh, does that give you any concerns uh, in Transcom? Senator, it absolutely does. Uh, as they begin to elbow their way into these countries, they will begin to affect their economic decisions and their diplomatic decisions, which uh, could dis uh, disrupt or delay our ability to access those same areas. So I am concerned uh, about their building operations around the world as they're trying to protect their growing interests, not only in South America, but in Africa. Thank you, General Walters. You, uh, off the question here a little bit, uh, do we still have uh, Afghan refugees in, in your purview? Sir, we just closed out the last set that were at Camp Bechtel, and they're safe and secure in another country right now. How many do you think you processed through your venue? We, we actually processed 70,000 through the four sites in Europe. Yeah, thank you. Awesome job. Uh, what do you think that, uh, what does Finland and Sweden bring to the table in NATO? Sir, the first thing they bring is uh, forces that are ready, and they have a history of doing some wonderful things against folks that elect to violate their sovereignty. And, and their ready forces help, help lead from the front uh, many of the other uh, national forces that represent the NATO nations. They have pretty strong military, considering their size? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, why do you think they shot hypersonics in Ukraine when they didn't have to? I think it was to demonstrate the capability and, and attempt to put fear in the hearts of the enemy, and I don't think they were successful. Yeah. That, what did it hit? Or was it one or two? We, uh, th there have been multiple launches. Okay. Uh, most of them have, have been directed at military targets, still TBD based off the intelligence returns. But, but what I can say is, is most of those strikes have been designated at specific <clears throat> military targets. One went one side of the country to the other. I mean, that takes a lot of guts to do that, uh, knowing that I guess they, they knew it was going to work. Uh, you know, when I was over in Ukraine a few months ago, and the generals there were telling me about the new armor that they were putting on tanks. Has that been successful for Russia? I noticed a lot of tanks are torn up. Uh, uh, do you have any information on that? Have they held up, you know, the new armor to the javelins and the, and the stingers? Uh, sir, this is pretty anecdotal, but the feedback we're getting is uh, if, if, if you have a lot of anti-armor, anti-tank munitions, 
uh, you, you can slow down a tank. So even their new armor has some chinks in their armor, so to speak, with respect to uh, multiple projectiles being launched at them. Have we seen any new weapons other than hypersonic used in this war? No, sir. No. I'm anxious to see how the the switchblades work. You know, I think that would that could be a, a huge benefit for us down the road and hopefully to Ukraine. Uh, let's see, I have a couple more here. Uh, General Van Ost, uh, Alabama is uh, proud to have been selected as the permanent home of the U.S. Space Command in Huntsville. Recently, there have been comments made that question uh, if the command would be able to easily move from their temporary home. Uh, that obviously would be part of your purview there. I just want to say that I have ever confidence in your ability to guide Transcom through facilitating this move following the IG's decision in the near future. Yeah. If you can pull off the last minute Afghanistan evacuation, this should be a piece of cake. But uh, hopefully we can get that done. But uh, I yield my time. And General, thank you for your service. You look forward to playing golf and fishing. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Tuberville. Senator Peters, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. General Walters, uh, let me uh, first uh, congratulate you and, and thank you for your 40 years uh, of service, your leadership and dedication to the, the men and women of our armed forces and our allies and partners uh, has certainly helped uh, shape uh, the unprecedented strength and, and the unity of NATO against uh, Putin's criminal uh, aggression. So thank you. Uh, in your posture statement, you highlight this is uh, perhaps the last time you expect to testify as a UCOM commander and the, and the history has yet to be written about how the illegal invasion of Ukraine uh, concludes. Uh, we will continue to count on you to remain uh, steadfast uh, in a difficult challenge until the time as you pass the mantle of leadership uh, for your com commander and NATO Supreme Allied Commander of Europe. Uh, General Alters, uh, in November of 2020, a trilateral ceasefire agreement was signed between Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Russia to conclude the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh. And it seems as if uh, Azerbaijan has taken advantage of the conflict uh, in Ukraine by launching unprovoked assaults against uh, Armenian villages. Given Russia's uh, poor military performance uh, in Ukraine, uh, I'm concerned about their ability to keep the peace, especially as uh, they may need to draw on the 2,000 Russian uh, uh, troops that are deployed there. So my question for you, sir, is what actions are we taking and what actions should we be taking to promote peace and stability in the Caucasus? Senator, what we, what we have to do first is ensure that through the defense attache offices in Azerbaijan is, is get the facts with respect to the activities in Nagorno-Karabakh. And, and as you can well imagine right now, there's lots of finger pointing taking place back and forth. And, and the facts, as we know right now, is that uh, Russia's involvement in, in imposing good order and discipline in that scenario was very little and very curious. So we, we'll continue to gather the facts and then take the next step forward with respect to uh, Russia's play in this activity and with respect to Nagorno-Karabakh's activities of, of their defense force and the Azerbaijan force. Great. General Walters, nowhere uh, in the world is the, the power of our alliance uh, more evident uh, than NATO. And the uh, Michigan National Guard is uh, proud to play a role in that alliance as uh, Latvia's uh, partner for nearly 30 years uh, through the National Guard's uh, state partnership program. Yeah, in January, members of the Latvian National Armed Forces trained on air and ground force synchronization at Joint Terminal Attack Controllers uh, in Camp Grayling, Michigan. My question for you, sir, is how valuable is the state partnership program to York uh, Security Cooperation Initiatives, and do you consider this an area of high return on investment uh, in your AOR? Sir, I would consider it an area of very high return on investment. The, the disposition of of the force elements in Latvia today are very robust. There are lots of U.S. entities in Latvia as we speak, and they're able to shoot, move, and communicate side by side with the Latvian Armed Forces to a, to a far more lethal degree than they have in the past as a result of the state partnership program. 
General officers, I, I understand that one brigade set uh, of the U.S. Army's uh, most modern uh, Abrams tank has been deployed from uh, the Army's pre position stock in Germany to Poland uh, to enhance NATO's deterrence posture. And given the use of heavy, uh, heavy armored uh, forces uh, by Russia in Ukraine, uh, uh, is continued, uh, is rapid mobilization of the Abrams as the most powerful ground combat vehicle that we have important to you as a combat commander in, uh, in Europe? It is, Senator. It's a tremendous force multiplier when it comes to deterrence. And is the recent decision by Poland to upgrade its tanks to the U.S. Army's uh, Abrams to replace older Russian designs a significant development for NATO and allied nations in Europe? Absolutely yes, Senator. General Van Ost, uh, in your posture statement, you highlighted the significance of air refueling mission and stressed the importance of uh, timely recapitalization. I spoke with Secretary Kendall just uh, last week, and uh, we each agree it is critical that Congress uh, provides the Air Force with uh, the right systems uh, needed to deliver needed capabilities. And while the 2006 RAND analysis of alternatives may be somewhat uh, outdated, uh, it certainly outlined a few recapitalization uh, options. Uh, so, so my question for you, ma'am, is uh, from a capability standpoint, what do you think is the best recapitalization strategy? Uh, thanks, Senator. As, as I said, that uh, air refueling is the lifeblood of our ability to project and employ a force. And if I could uh, also mention that the, we cannot do it without the total force, so I appreciate uh, the National Guard uh, capacity. Uh, the best way to, to recapitalize is to have a stable plan uh, that gets after the capabilities we're going to need in the future. The KC-46 is the future of air refueling because it can do multiple things and it is connected to the battle, both with Link-16 and ability to uh, command, uh, to be able to get communications off board and long range from that aircraft securely. So as we look to develop the, what capabilities we need in the future uh, in a contested environment, uh, we'll be looking at the lessons from the KC-46. I'll be working with the Air Force to describe those requirements into the future. Great. Well, well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you very much, uh, Senator Peters. Uh, I want to thank uh, both the witnesses, General Walters, not only for your testimony, but for your extraordinary service over many, many decades. Uh, you are in the most, uh, at this moment, critical position, I think, in the military. And we're all fortunate that you're here there. And thank you very much. And please communicate that to the men and women, particularly the 82nd Airborne Division. I, yes, sir, uh, all American. And General Van Overs, thank you very much for your thoughtful approach to these problems and your very clear uh, signals to us that we need to make some significant and difficult uh, decisions with respect to uh, reconfiguring our, our logistics, particularly in conflicted areas. With that, in the absence of any further of my colleagues here, I will adjourn the hearing.